This Sunday, the fate of Roe v. Wade. How dare they tell a woman what she can do and cannot do with her own body? A divided country reacts to that draft Supreme Court decision. I've been praying for this for as long as I've understood what a baby was, um, and it's a big deal. This is an attack on women. In Washington, strong reaction from abortion rights supporters. It's an assault on women. I'm going to fight like hell to protect this right for Michigan women. It rocks my confidence in, in the court. While most Republicans shy away from the issue and instead focus on the leak. To say breach of protocol, I think will compromise the ability of the court to find consensus. The most egregious breach of trust at the Supreme Court that has ever happened. Plus the fallout. Will this galvanize Democrats heading into the midterm election? This MAGA crowd is really the most extreme political ex organization that's existed in American history. They want to get off of the things that are so unpopular about this president. Also, could a nationwide ban be the next step? Are other rights in jeopardy? And can either party find a position that meets Americans where they are? I'll talk to Mississippi's Republican Governor Tate Reeves, who supports banning most abortions and to Michigan's Attorney General Dana Nessel, who opposes an automatic abortion ban that would go into effect in her state. Also inside the court's decision-making process with former Supreme Court clerks, Neil Katyal and Jennifer Mascott. Plus our panel, Kimberly atkins Store, Sarah Fagan, Josh Gerstein, and Ali Vitale. Welcome to Sunday and a special edition of Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is a special edition of Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. A good Sunday morning and a happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, including my mother, grandmother, and wife. The draft decision overturning Roe v. Wade has only added to the growing perception that the Supreme Court is just one more partisan institution, now a creature of politics, no longer above it. The leaked decision was a victory for conservatives who have worked decades for this moment. And it was a shock to millions of Americans who have never lived in a world without abortion rights. In this morning's special edition, we're going to cover this story from all angles. The real world fallout, the confusing checkerboard of state laws that would soon be in effect, along with real questions about what other rights might be in jeopardy. The political fallout, many Democrats believe the issue will help them in the midterms. But the idea that overturning Roe would energize Democratic voters has never been tested. It will be now. Plus the court itself and its broken confirmation process, manipulated most recently by Mitch McConnell to manufacture this conservative majority that appears ready to overturn Roe in a country that apparently wants it preserved. With 50 states making their own rules, it all adds up to further division in a country already split in two. Women's rights in America are under attack. We're going to win in 2022. Roe v. Wade is not going to change the outcome. After the leak of that early draft ruling reversing Roe, the Supreme Court appears poised to overturn Roe v. Wade. Governors and state legislators are rushing to define their positions in a post-Roe world. The lives of unborn children are... Uh, it's, we're, we're, it's very important that we protect the lives of them. Where is the Democratic Party? Where's the party? Why aren't we calling this out? This is a concerted, coordinated effort. And yes, they're winning. Should Roe be overturned, at least 25 states will likely ban abortion. 13 of them have trigger bans, meaning it will immediately be outlawed. It means lights out in North Dakota. It's a shot in the face. It's just like, bam, to women of color especially. We're going to continue to, to focus on those women, um, focusing on the humanity of those women. Democrats are hoping to turn voter attention away from high inflation ahead of the midterms by drawing a sharp contrast on abortion rights. This MAGA crowd is really the most extreme political ex organization that's existed in American history. And warning that Republicans via the court's conservative majority could take away or erode other rights from access to contraception to same-sex marriage protections. National Republicans have focused on the leak itself. The leak is reprehensible. Egregious breach of trust. We'll find the leaker. And largely avoided questions about the future of abortion rights. Well, that's not the story for today. A document circulated by the NRSC, the campaign committee in charge of getting Senate Republicans elected, 
advises Republican candidates to, quote, be the compassionate consensus builder on abortion policy. There should be an exception for rape and incest. Uh, so I think that's where I think that's where the American public public is. Already, Democrats are raising the issue in competitive midterm races from Michigan to Florida, New Hampshire, Nevada to Wisconsin. I'm at the Supreme Court where it looks like Ron Johnson is going to get exactly what he wants, overturning Roe v. Wade. As both parties try to define each other by their most extreme positions. Would you ever support a ban that does not make exceptions for incest or rape or life-threatening conditions? I support a total ban. Yes, absolutely. Oh, there should not be exceptions. The answer is no. In a recent Pew poll, just 8% of Americans say abortion should be illegal in all cases, without exception. 37% overall say it should be illegal, including those who want exceptions. 61% say it should be legal in all or most cases. Still, though a majority of Americans support Roe, Senate Democrats do not have the votes to codify it in legislation. They expect to take it up and fail to pass it later this week. This is not just one vote and then this issue goes away. You will hear a lot from us through the next months, all the way through November. Mississippi is one of the 13 states with trigger laws that would ban abortion once Roe is overturned. And of course, the draft opinion is about a case in Mississippi. Tate Reeves is the governor of Mississippi, an opponent of abortion rights, and he joins me now. Governor Reeves, welcome back to Meet the Press. Well, thank you for having me on this morning, Chuck. And, and uh, as an aside, a happy Mother's Day to all those moms out there, particularly the First Lady of Mississippi and my mom and grandma. Well, let me, uh, let me double down on that and wish them a happy Mother's Day as well. Uh, let me ask about this, this case itself. One of the odder aspects of your law is that this law appears to have been passed with the intent of hoping it would not be enacted. The reason I say is it, you, you passed a 15-week ban after this trigger law was passed in 07. And I know you were a lieutenant governor when the 15-week ban was. But, but the whole point of this was to get a case to the Supreme Court to overturn Roe. So will the 15-week ban, if Roe is overturned, ever be implemented in the state of Mississippi? Well, well you're, you're right that the, the trigger law was put into effect in, in 2007. I should point out, uh, and I think this really points towards sort of the changing uh, approach with the two political parties on this issue, but the 2007 trigger law was actually enacted with a Democrat Speaker of the House, and it was enacted with a, a Democrat Chairman of the Public Health Committee. But when we enacted the 15-week ban, our initial intent and our goal was really just to save babies' lives. We believe that if Roe was not ever overturned, that it was certainly the viewpoint of Mississippians that if we could enact laws that would save babies' lives, that, that it would be uh, a, an endeavor to do so. If, in fact, the, the leaked opinion, Chuck, is accurate, and if, in fact, this court votes to overturn Roe, you are correct. Our trigger law will go into effect, and we will ban abortions with the exceptions of rape and the, the life of the mother because of that trigger law that passed uh, in 2007. Yeah, um, I, I noticed that trigger law doesn't include an exception for incest. Why? Well, I wasn't in the legislature or in the executive branch at that time. Uh, that was a decision that was made. Um, by, by the uh, Mississippi legislature. And I think it's certainly um, a, a conversation. There are exceptions for rape. There are exceptions for the life of the mother. And, um, and we'll see uh, what happens based upon the ultimate uh, outcome of this uh, Dobbs case uh, that is before the Supreme Court. What about uh, contraception and, 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 the, and birth control, particularly IUDs? I mean, is this total ban that gets put in on abortion is that going to have an impact on women that decide to have certain types of birth control like IUDs? I don't think that it is going to apply to those uh, that choose to use birth control. Um, I believe that um, clearly uh, life begins at conception and I am trying uh, very hard to, uh, to, to make sure that everyone uh, in America knows that the overturning of Roe certainly puts the decision making on abortion policy back in the elected representatives in, in each of the 50 states. That, by the way, is where the decision making was in America for the first 200 years of our country until uh, 1972, when, in my opinion, Roe was wrongly decided. 
I, you know, it's interesting you say that, that the Supreme Court's going to take something, take away a right that was in the hands of individual women. And I want to play something for you from Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who believes this decision uh, essentially takes away some of her citizenship. Take a listen. I hope every human being in this country understands that when you take away a woman's right to make her decisions about her health and well-being, she is no longer a full citizen. She no longer has freedom. She no longer has bodily autonomy. She no longer has basic civil rights or civil liberties. Um, respond to her. Uh, how does this not take away a woman's right to control her own body? Well, that... that right that, that she is, is talking about, that there is no right to an abortion in the United States Constitution. In fact, there's also nothing in the U.S. Constitution which precludes individual states from regulating uh, abortion policy. And what I would say to you, Chuck, and, and, and look, I'm empathetic to, to all of these um, ladies who find themselves in, in very difficult uh, times and very difficult uh, decisions. Uh, but what makes this different, what makes abortion different is if you believe as I believe, that's an unborn child in that mother's womb. Uh, that is, uh, what, what we're trying to do is stand up for the rights of those unborn children. Stand up for those who absolutely cannot stand up for themselves. That's why this, this decision is, is so important. It's also why uh, there's very high emotions on both sides mm -hmm. of, of this particular topic, and I understand that. Look, you've just said that you believe life be begins at conception. If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, um, would you sign it? Well, I don't think that's going to happen in Mississippi. I'm sure they'll have those conversations in, in other states. But you're not states, answering but, the question. Uh, as is always the case with things. Well, that's always the case. There, there's, uh, there's so many things that we can talk about. What, what the next movement in, in, in the pro-life movement, in, in my view, Chuck, is, is simple. And that is we must prove that being pro-life is not just about anti-abortion. What we want to do next is we want to continue to focus on the two things that are very important, and that is ensuring that those expectant mothers have the resources that they need. That's why in Mississippi this year we invested significant additional resources in pregnancy resource centers and that we're working to build a system. We have 37 of those in Mississippi, and we're working to build a system throughout our state to ensure that every expectant mother has access to the information and the education that they need. The second piece of the equation and the second piece of the, the, the next phase of the pro-life movement is we've got to make sure that we make it easier on those babies that are born either through the potential for uh, adoptive services. Uh, we've got to make it easier for adoptions. We've got to find resources for adoptions. We've got to also make sure that we improve our foster care system. In Mississippi, for instance, we invested over $100 million combined of our ARPA funds uh, as well as other state funds to improve technology at our Department of Human Services, at our Child Protection Services, yeah. so that those babies that, that are not adopted, that end up in our foster care system, that we care for them and we do so uh, in a way that, that recognizes the importance Governor, of, of the next phase of the movement. Governor, though, you're a state that really doesn't do a good job of helping children. One in three Mississippi children live in po poverty. If you're going to order women to be pregnant, and that's what your law is going to do. The state is going to order women to stay pregnant. Um, you're talking about providing resources while they're pregnant. What are you going to do for that child after they're born? What are you going to do for that mother? Um, are, are, you know, again, I look back at Mississippi's numbers here. Um, child poverty is already uh, at, at a level that is, to me, should be unsustainable. Why should we believe that you're going to provide the resources for these women if they have these babies? Well, well, look, Chuck, I mean, it's a, it's a fair question and, and one that, that what I want you to know is that when I was uh, sworn into office in the middle of January of 2020 in my inaugural address, I made it very clear 
that my job as governor is not to try to hide our challenges, not to try to hide our problems, but to find solutions to those problems. And that's what we're going to continue to do. It's the reason I just mentioned uh, that we are investing $100 million in technology for our Department of Child Protection Services. Um, there is no doubt that our uh, we have a long history of health outcomes that are, are, are not acceptable. We have a long history of, of poverty. And the way in which you address poverty, um, government has a real challenge is doing that. But the way in which you address poverty is by improving educational attainment, improving educational outcomes, uh, and, and by improving the opportunities and job skills uh, for those individuals so that they can go to work and provide for themselves and provide for their families. And, and those are the, it's a multifaceted approach and yeah. it's certainly uh, not easy and, and I would never argue that it is, but I can, can, I can tell you with certainty that in Mississippi we're working right. hard every day to address uh, each and every one of those issues. Governor, the last thing is at the end of the day, women have less rights under this law than men do. How do you justify it? What I would say, Chuck, is at the end of the day, there is no right to an abortion in the United States Constitution. That the, the issue with abortions that makes it very different is that there is a life. There is an American child in that womb. And it's incumbent upon those of us who are elected to stand up for the rights of those individuals that can't stand up for themselves. Governor Tate Reeves, Republican governor of Mississippi, appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Thanks, Chuck. The story in Michigan is a bit different from Mississippi's. Michigan, typically uh, a blue state, has an abortion ban that was passed in 1931, and it would go into effect if Roe v. Wade was overturned. The state's Democratic governor, Gretchen Whitmer, wrote on Twitter that she will keep fighting like hell to preserve abortion rights. Dana Nessel is uh, Michigan's attorney general. She joins me now. Madam Attorney General, it's good to see you. Thanks for having me, Chuck, and uh, happy Mother's Day to my mom and to all the moms out and, there. And a happy Mother's Day to you uh, and also your mom. Let me start with the decision you've already made. You said if, if Roe is overturned, you are not going to uh, enforce this 1931 law, but you can't prevent others in the state from enforcing the law. Explain. Well, there's 83 duly elected prosecutors uh, for every county in our state. As attorney general, I have statewide jurisdiction, and um, I, I ran on a platform of understanding that likely during the course of my term, Roe v. Wade would be overturned, and this incredibly draconian and strict 1931 law would criminalize abortion in this state with virtually no exceptions, no exception for rape, for incest, no exception for medical emergencies. And understanding that the lives of our 2.2 million women who are of childbearing age in this state, their lives would be at risk. I refuse to enforce uh, this draconian law that will endanger their yeah. lives uh, and put at jeopardy the health, safety, and welfare of the lives of each and every woman in the state of Michigan. Look, I want to bring up, it's part of the Michigan Penal Code. Uh, and I want to note one other aspect of this law. It actually makes mention of the use of, of drugs. Uh, any person who shall in any manner sell or publicly expose for sale drugs or a combination of drugs designed expressly for the use of females for the purpose of procuring an abortion shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. The druggist or dealer selling the same shall register the name of the purchaser, the date of the sale, and then the name and residence of the physician prescribing the same. Uh, Madam Attorney General, this is a, seems like a draconian law and puts the doctor and the woman in criminal jeopardy. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, I think you absolutely are. And if you look again uh, at the phrasing of the, uh, of the law that prohibits abortion in the first place, it talks about administering medication for an abortion. And so... You know, even if the woman were to procure abortion medication and then take it on her own, she herself would be guilty of that crime. So we're talking about not just um, throwing providers and anybody who works with a provider under aiding and abetting theories in prison, but also women themselves uh, who procured abortion through abortion medication. Yeah. So it's a really scary set of circumstances for women here in Michigan. Uh, look, I mean, another instance, uh, the tragedy of a miscarriage. Does this mean a doctor cannot perform the procedure that's necessary, essentially, 
when you when you've identified a miscarriage, I, it it seems to me that that some OBGYNs are going to think they are committing a crime if they essentially just do what most doctors would do right there, which is the DNC. Yeah, I think that what's going to happen is doctors will be so afraid uh, that there'll be investigations into these procedures, even understanding that many times those procedures are performed where there, you know, there is no viability any longer. But because it's the same procedure that you might perform uh, for an abortion, they'll be so concerned that these uh, cases will be investigated. It will have a chilling effect, and you won't have basic medical health care that is required for women not to um, have extreme health problems or even die. Right. Doctors simply are not going to perform those procedures anymore because they don't want to go to prison for it. All right, let's talk about the various forms of relief that you and other abortion rights supporters in Michigan are seeking. You've got the governor's, I guess you call it a lawsuit, to this, or trying to get clarification from the Supreme Court, state Supreme Court, to, I guess, to wipe out the, the, the law. Planned Parenthood has filed a suit against you, which you have said is misguided, um, but obviously they're trying to attain a similar outcome from the state Supreme Court. And then there is a petition, uh, a campaign circulating to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot. Um, those deadlines are in July. What is, the, what is the safest way to protect abortion rights in Michigan right now of those three paths? Well, firstly, I think each and every eligible voter in the state should be signing on to the you know, reproductive rights for all petition and then coming to the polls and voting on it in November and for voting for every pro-choice Democrat up and down the ticket, whether it's for federal office or for state office. But in addition, you know, I have great hope and I put my full support and my attorneys are representing the governor in her lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And I'm very hopeful that the Michigan Supreme Court will find that under our Equal Protection Clause, under our Due Process Clause of the Michigan Constitution, that, you know, the right to an abortion um, is, you know, fundamental yeah. under our Michigan Constitution, even if the United States Supreme Court decides otherwise. But let's make it very clear. The radical and extremist position of the Republicans in our state and all around the country completely contradicts what the public wants, and it really does place the lives of women in jeopardy. Let's be clear. Women in my state and in states all over America are going to die because of this position. Uh, and I heard the Mississippi governor, when you interview him, he refused to answer the question of whether or not he would sign a bill completely outlawing the use of birth control. That is not in line at all with how Americans yeah. see their rights. And politicians do not belong in our doctor's offices. They don't belong right. in our bedrooms. And they should not be making these kinds of decisions on behalf of the American public and on behalf of women across America. I, I just want to clarify, is the constitutional amendment the better guarantee here? Because maybe you get a ruling from this version of your state Supreme Court, but I assume you don't want to be relying on that in the future. Yeah, that's correct. I think, I think we need to see both. Um, I would like to see a ruling from the Michigan Supreme Court so that uh, there's not even any period of time under which women are denied reproductive health care in Michigan. But then in addition to that, absolutely, this needs to be codified into our state constitution. Uh, and if we have enough people that care about this issue and who come out to vote in November, I see that happening. And I think that is right. that both of these courses of action need to occur in order to better protect women in our state. Dana Nessel, who's the chief law enforcement officer as the attorney general in the state of Michigan, uh, and suddenly may be confronting this sooner than she ever imagined. Appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective. Thanks for having me. When we come back, what are the chances that the draft decision will change substantially? And if it doesn't, what other rights might be in jeopardy? I'm gonna speak to two former Supreme Court law clerks take us inside the court's machinations. That's it. Welcome back. One reason abortion rights supporters are so upset with the draft decision involves something called stare decisis. It's the idea that courts are bound by legal precedent. Both Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh suggested in their confirmation hearing that precedent would be important in considering Roe. Here's Kavanaugh from his confirmation hearing. It's settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court entitled to respect under principles of stare decisis. And one of the important things to keep in mind about Roe v. Wade 
is that it has been reaffirmed many times over the past uh, 45 years. A lot of people heard a lot in that sentence. I think all we can say now is he stated fact. I'm joined now by two legal experts to discuss the draft decision and where the court might go from here. Neil Katyal is a former acting U.S. Solicitor General. He clerked for Stephen Breyer and has argued 45 cases before the court. And Jennifer Mascott is an assistant law professor at George Mason University. She's clerked for both Kavanaugh and Clarence Thomas. I should make the note for Kavanaugh. It was at the circuit level, if I, if I have that right. Uh, welcome to both of you. Hopefully you can take us inside the court here a little bit. I want to, the leak was, uh, decision was not the first leak. There was a first leak, and it was a few days before Wall Street Journal editorial board. I want to note a little something here, Neil. The oral argument suggested that five justices lean toward doing so, but a ferocious lobbying campaign is trying to change their minds. The particular targets are Justice Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh within five days. This editorial would go on to speculate correctly that Alito was writing the majority opinion. Um, it, it appears there is a debate happening in the court. Take us inside the court. When you read this, you put it together, what's going on? Yeah, so I think that the leak that came this week from Politico is the more extreme one because we actually see the draft opinion, something right. that, to my knowledge, has never happened. So the process is there was an oral argument in December. The justices all voted in a conference. Nobody else was allowed into that conference. They take a tentative vote. The senior most justice then assigns the opinion to herself, himself, or whomever. Here it looks like it was assigned to Alito. And then that draft was circulated in February for comment by the other justices. It's, of course, possible that votes change. That sometimes happens. But it's extremely rare. So what this decision says, and you started with stare decisis, it's so important because this draft decision says they're going to overrule Roe versus Wade, overall Planned Parenthood versus Casey. It's as extreme an opinion, Chuck, as you could imagine. It looks like it was written by Robert Bork, the failed Supreme Court nominee. Jennifer, you've clerked for Brett Kavanaugh on the circuit. Is, is he, do you sense that he's waiting to see what the chief justice, who may be writing another opinion, that seems to be the speculation, that would preserve Roe and allow maybe a new definition of viability, do you sense that that is something he's open to? Well, first, let me just join you both in saying I think the leak this week was unprecedented and is outrage. I mean, the Supreme Court's a very collegial institution. The justices across the nine chambers work in a lot of trust and uh, confidence with each other and are, I think are trying to neutrally apply the rule of law. And I think it's actually quite uh, breathtaking how detailed and well-reasoned and thorough this opinion was as of February. And so I think what uh, Justice Kavanaugh and the rest of the justices will be doing is applying the Constitution as they understand it and are not going to allow themselves to be bullied or intimidated by this outrageous leak this week. All right, but going back to whether Kavanaugh is 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 weighing the precedent issue here, did uh, did Susan Collins um, o- only hear what she wanted? in that statement from Brett Kavanaugh? Well, I think what this draft opinion makes very clear is that the court itself has never been able, after all these decades, to settle on what justification would uphold the reasoning in Roe. In fact, that decision's been divisive and criticized from the day that it came down. And so I think the justices are looking at the text of the Constitution and recognizing that perhaps the court has had a hard time settling on a justification because there's just no right in the Constitution on this complicated moral issue that more properly belongs with the American people. Neil, when you read Alita's opinion, did you say to yourself, would it change how you might have defended uh, Roe or argued it in the first place? I totally disagree with my friend Jennifer. There was nothing persuasive in that draft whatsoever. Roe was, of course, a contentious decision, it was, but it was decided by a 7-2 to two majority of the court. Five of those seven were Republican-appointed justices, and the Supreme Court in 1992 sailed well past Jennifer's point. They said even if Roe might be have different theoretical bases, privacy, equal protection, whatever, it's now the law of the land. The court's credibility is staked on it, being the law of the land. Social expectations have crystallized around it. So for them to overrule this, Chuck, which is the super precedent mm-hmm. of super precedents, calls every other precedent in question, from gay marriage to contraception, as you were talking about before with the right. Mississippi governor. I want to ask actually about the, because in the draft opinion, Alito tries to say, hey, I don't want this to be used for anything else, because privacy has been used for contraception. Privacy has been used to justify same-sex marriage. Just because you say it doesn't mean it's true. Oh, I mean, we learned this with Bush v. Gore. So why, sh- why shouldn't folks who are, who are in uh, mar- or same-sex marriages be, uh, 
Why shouldn't they be nervous right now? Unfortunately, I think they have to be nervous right now. It's the rationale that the court, that, that Justice Alito used in the draft opinion. If that draft opinion rationale stays the law of the land, it says basically the right has to be historically rooted in the deep traditions of the people. That is not, I think, a test that gay marriage mm-hmm. would meet if you have that kind of, uh, you know, really harsh reading. And it does reflect, a, you know, underlying conception that, the, you know, some justices on this court, you know, pretend to be talking about the original intent of the Constitution, and they are anything but when it comes to striking down the Voting Rights Act. They make up the doctrine when they call corporations people. They make up the doctrine. It's not in the text of the Constitution. Jennifer, why should folks who who are in same-sex marriages be comforted by what Alito wrote in the draft opinion. Chuck, with respect, Neil, I think here is just flat wrong. And I think President Biden's remarks just this week show why. Even he acknowledged that we've got complicated questions here involving a child that makes this case fundamentally different from any other issue. We have another human life at issue. These are complicated questions the American people feel strongly about. And the language that Neil's quoting, deeply rooted, comes from a 1997 opinion that itself was quoting opinions back to the 1930s. This is nothing new. This is an unprecedented issue, unique of its kind. I think it's quite telling that the instant this draft was leaked, people started talking about other questions, not this one, as if this opinion itself really is not all that objectionable. You don't believe that this is getting rid of a right to privacy, that basically is saying there's no right to privacy in the Constitution? I don't think that this opinion says that more generally because it's focused on the right of an interest of the child. And essentially here, the court is actually doing an admirable thing, I think, in the draft Mm -hmm. opinion and taking itself out of the seat of power and leaving decisions up to the American people. Neil, where does this go? Does the Supreme Court going to hear more abortion cases, uh, assuming they do overturn Roe for for now in perpetuity? I think they will. And the idea that this draft is going to return things to the people, I think, is just ludicrous. I mean, I'd feel a lot better if the Republican Party wasn't a party built on basically keeping the voters away from the polls and the like. You can't preach the language of democracy on Monday and then on the other six days of the week try and take it away from the American people. And so, yes, Chuck, I think... Whatever the court does here, there's going to be abortion case after abortion case. Your guests just a moment ago discussed things like contraception, right. Louisiana's banning IUDs and the like. Uh, you know, so absolutely, they're in the thick of it. All right. I, I literally have to go. Do you expect this opinion to change much from the draft opinion? You not don't. at all. I respect the justices. They will not be intimidated. And what do you expect? I can't predict that one at all. This is unprecedented. You think, it's, you think it's possible they rehear the case, don't you? Oh, I do. I think yeah. they could rehear the case, and I also would never count the chief justice out. His vote didn't matter in, in de- December, right. but it might matter now. Rehearing would be a now. disaster, a disaster. Neil Katyal, Jennifer Mascott, thank you both uh, for being here. I appreciate it. When we come back, Democrats are hoping that overturning Roe will generate anger in their base. We see it happening. Will it lead to a big turnout in November? That part, we don't know yet. Panel is next. Welcome back. Panelists here, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent, Ali Vitale, legal affairs reporter, Josh Gerstein, the man who broke the Supreme Court story of all time, if you will, uh, for Politico, former uh, George W. Bush, White House political director, Sarah Fagan, and Kimberly Atkins Storr, senior opinion writer for the Boston Globe, also a holder of a law degree, so watch out. <laughs> uh, Josh, let me start with you. Um, has it sunk in what this, what your report perhaps has done to the Supreme Court for a generation? Well, it's starting to. I mean, when that large black imposing fence went up around the court uh, earlier in the week, uh, certainly indicated that the court itself now realizes that whatever decision it issues on this is going to have pretty dramatic, momentous implications and and probably is likely to anger a number of people on one side or the other. Do you think it's going to change the way you get to cover the court? Um, Well, it probably makes it even harder uh, to press some of the issues for access to the court. We've had a lot of concerns about uh, the court and transparency, even through this period of COVID over the last, uh, you know, couple of years, but even before that. So um, they're probably going to be even more skittish about that than they were before. But it was not a terribly transparent institution to start with. That's for sure. Look, we talk a a lot of times we'll say, hey, boy, this is going to change everything politically. Allie, this feels... Did you sense that on Capitol? Is this actually a moment where we say everything's changing and it's really changing? Well, look, I mean, I think that Democrats and Republicans both have been talking about this in theory for a really long time. I know it's not popular to say we don't know, but this is totally untested. For the last 49 years, women in America haven't had to grapple with wondering if there are protections in place for abortion. And so I think from an electorate perspective, 
All of this remains untested, and so we'll have to see going forward. I will say on the Hill, Democrats and Republicans took, of course, completely divergent views here. Republicans, of course, focusing on the leak, not the substance. You'd almost be forgiven if you wondered, hey, didn't they push for this for several decades? On the Democratic side, though, and we'll see this next week, they're going to push for a vote on the Women's Health Protection Act on Wednesday. It's going to fail. There seems to be some divide on if it's better if it fails in bipartisan fashion right. or in fully democratic fashion. But nevertheless, it sort of leaves them where they started in terms of having no way to federally codify this. Politically, if you just look at exit polling, uh, Sarah and, and Kimberly, this appears to favor the Democrats. Let me put up some battleground uh, state polling on the abortion issue. Majorities in just about every battleground state in 2020 uh, um, but wanted it legal. Only Texas is sort of the outlier of plurality, 48-45. And you, of course, look at Colorado there, the very libertarian, uh, not a surprise there. Um, so I understand, Kimberly, why Democrats think this is a game changer for them for the midterms, is it? It, it, we'll have to see because this is so unprecedented in the way that it's coming out and it is a midterm election year to boot. We will have to see. I, I think we've talked before about a lot of other issues that Democrats thought would be big motivators and yeah. it turned out not to be. They turned out to fit whether it's gun control, uh, whether it's police reform, and it turned out not to be. So I think we will have to see. I think one thing Democrats really should be thinking about is their long game at this point because this is the result of a Republican long game mm -hmm. that was very dedicated for decades in order to put conservatives in office so that they can put conservatives on courts and then Democrats need to develop something like that. I think it's a bit of a tale of two stories. I, I do think it will motivate Democrats. I don't know how it couldn't. And they've, they are incredibly depressed. You look at polling. Mm -hmm. the, the question, though, is what is the debate? And the debate may cut against Democrats, where you have a very aggressive progressive movement that believes that abortion on demand at any point in a pregnancy, which is not where the public is. So uh, you showed exit polling. It shows people who want abortion legal. The question is, what is the definition mm -hmm. of legal? And so if we have a debate in this country in a number of these states where the Democratic candidate is calling for abortion at any point in the pregnancy and a Republican candidate is calling for a more moderate stance, that is going to accrue to the Republican where, Party. Where, where is there evidence that the Republicans have a well, moderate I mean, stance sir, here? There isn't. I mean... That, that's the thing. What you, what you outlined on the left is correct, but I don't but, hear exceptions anymore for rape uh, uh, all the time in many well, Republicans we just, anymore. We just heard Tate Reeves talk about exceptions for rape in the life of the mother. But not and, incest. And that, I imagine that will go through pretty quickly, well, but that, we'll see. But see, that's and, where it, that's, I think, making my and point. And after here. that point, yeah. though, there was a, a law passed in Mississippi on uh, viability at 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, th that as the debate moves to viability, Republicans are in a much stronger position than where the progressive movement is. But is the debate viability? Well, I mean, I think the, the real issue is that while there may be a debate, as Sarah is saying, what's going to happen right away if Roe is struck down at the end of June is all these trigger laws and laws that are already on the books from 100 years ago are going to kick in in many, many states. Uh, we're talking maybe 26 states that will almost immediately end up with very severe restrictions or bans on abortion. So the debate may continue, but in those states, women are going to find a great deal of difficulty in getting access. In some states, they may have to travel a thousand miles in order to get an abortion. I was, I was just in South Dakota. It's one of those states with a trigger law, and they've already had one of the most restrictive set of rules there governing what they can do for years. They are so restricted that they're finding they have to have doctors come in from out of state because local doctors are either too worried about the local repercussions or they don't want to do it. And at the same time, they're talking about women traveling over a thousand miles because of just the vastness in some of these rural states. And so when you talk about the trigger law states, effectively what you could end up with is on the coast, those two patches of blue where it's accessible and mostly in the middle of the country where it's not. So you sort of just have have and have not. I mean, I, I, I think there's a look, there's a lot of manufactured outrage happening around this issue. You know, Illinois is completely controlled by Democrats. And uh, these legislatures, I think, will move very quickly around these uh, this legislation. So, yes, there's going to be a period of significant tumult around this, mm -hmm. and people who feel very passionately about the protection of life, um, you know, are going to be loud, but the people who feel pr right. passionate about abortion are going to also be loud, and we're going to spend probably most of this fall talking about abortion. Well, it's interesting, Kimberly, that they, my experience with abortion is the party that overreaches gets punished. And what does overreach look like to the public? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to get a good idea about what that overreach looks like as these laws come into play. We also need to talk about what voters were talking about, and especially in statewide races, there's always this big focus on women voters, suburban women voters. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that a lot of those women will still have access to abortion regardless of what state they live, live in. It's the others, the people who are in a different position who won't. Uh, I'm going to pause it there. Uh, we want to make note, sadly, of a grim milestone that we reached this past week as a country. According to our account here at NBC News, one million Americans have now died of COVID. In addition, the World Health Organization announced this past week that 15 million more people than had been counted appeared to have died during the pandemic than would have under normal circumstances. We're starting to see countries underreported some deaths, and we're starting to get the reality check now. So previously, six million more were estimated to have died than what we first thought. It's a reminder that even as we learn to live with COVID, millions remained at risk and do so now. Keep that in mind. Keep them in mind. And we'll be right back. We are back. Data download time. Democrats are hoping the news about Roe will energize their base. And they have their eyes on younger voters. And here's why. Among younger voters, three quarters say abortion should be legal in all or most cases. That's 20 percentage points more than the share of voters over 65 who share that view. That large gap matters because those groups of voters do not usually turn out in the same numbers, especially when it comes to the midterms. Let me show you. Look, here's younger voters in a presidential year. They, are, they become almost one in five voters. But in midterm years, you can see here young voters down to the 12, 13 percent. But even in a, that good Democratic year of 18, younger voters didn't quite get out. Meanwhile, those 65 plus voters are far more likely to go to the polls no matter the election. The question now is, could a Supreme Court opinion that overturns a nearly 50-year precedent in Roe be enough to alter that picture and motivate a younger elector? We may just about to be fi uh, finding out come November. When we come back, Donald Trump's endorsement pushed J.D. Vance to victory in Ohio's Republican Senate primary. It was a win for Mr. Trump. The game's about to get a lot harder as May rolls on. Stick with us. Welcome back. Uh, literally the day of the leak or on the eve of the uh, of the Ohio primary, we got the Supreme Court leak too early to really have an impact on what what voters may have done. But we did find out that Donald Trump's endorsement of J.D. Vance uh, did help him win. So, Sarah Fagan, uh, is Donald Trump literally or figuratively in charge of the Republican Party these days? Well, I think that somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And in a case like Ohio, where it was a pretty crowded primary, where none of the candidates were particularly defined, he's going to have a huge impact. And he's going to make uh, his endorsement's going to be a big deal. You know, in, the, in a case like Georgia, where you have an incumbent governor who's had a long track record and, you know, it's not having as much of an impact. So I think on a case by case basis, probably net accrues to the president's favor in terms yeah. of these endorsements, but he's not going to get them all. You know, Sarah Longwell, I think, put it pretty well. Um... Uh, Kimberly, Mr. Trump has already won. Whether Mr. Trump's handpicked candidates win or not, the Republican field that will emerge from these primary battles will be overwhelmingly Trumpy. I think that's a fair take. I think that's right. I think one thing we see that is powerful is Trumpism, regardless of whether mm -hmm. Trump himself pronounces the candidate's name correctly. You have in someone like J.D. Vance just a mini Trump, someone who is trying to espouse this populist mm -hmm. uh, message, even though he himself as the messenger doesn't represent that. That's Donald Trump to a T. And the, the candidates that are able to capture that and re replicate it the best in this particular Republican Party are going to do well, whether Trump endorses them or not. We know some Senate Republicans, Ali, were hoping that Trump's endorsements uh, would not do so well. That, you know, and, and all right, so he's not going to do well in Georgia. And Dr. Oz looks like a coin flip yeah. at best. Um, but I don't think his grip's weakening that much. Yeah, I mean, so let's say he goes 50-50 over the course of the next month. Whether or not you consider that a win is kind of through the eye of the beholder. I think for Senate Republicans and Republicans in Washington, the goal has always just been make sure he's not endorsing the candidate who can't ultimately win. And so I think that's going to ultimately come out in the wash. But I do think that the larger question is, in a place like Georgia, where his endorsement probably is not going to have the swing that he wants, Trump's vendettas have never been party loyal. They have mm -hmm. always been just whatever his vendetta personally is. And I think that's that's where the concern stems from for Republicans in Washington is you're not there for the party. And frankly, a lot of these Republicans that he's endorsing, they don't have deep party ties either. And so you could end up with Republicans coming to Washington who are much more indebted to Trump than they are to the people who are in control of the Senate here. You know what he hasn't done, Josh, to keep it sort of in your wheelhouse? He hasn't really commented on the leaked 
document, you would think he'd say, look what my judges did. I told you they'd overturn Roe, and now maybe he's waiting to make sure it actually happens. But the lack of taking credit, his political antenna, to me, is telling him, this is, he's a little nervous. Yeah, you do wonder if he's seeing some of this polling that clearly other Republicans are seeing, saying that this issue may be a loser for them uh, in the fall. And I also wonder in some of these races where Trump's um, no nomination or his endorsement has made the difference, whether when you get to the general election, that you're going to see candidates try to do a straddle, sort of like mm -hmm. Glenn Youngkin did, right, where he was sort of semi-accepting Trump's energy but didn't quite want to appear with him. Can they maintain that straddle all the way to wow. November? Or so it makes David McCormick to me the most interesting candidate in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. It's like, boy, if you're the Democrats now, you don't want McCormick to get out of here because he's both been running as a Trumpy candidate, but suddenly he gets to say, Trump didn't like me. That's right. Yeah, I, I, D David uh, McCormick is a compelling candidate for a lot of reasons. He's he's a, a exceptional person. But the, you know, look, you're right. The, many of these Republicans are going to have to walk that line, and. Um, they're going to have to do what Glenn Youngkin did, which is to say, I like a lot of what Trump did. I like his policies and I like his energy, mm -hmm. but I'm my own person and I have my own ideas. And that's why these incumbents fare so well in these endorsement battles, because they do have their own identity. Kimberly, uh, an another thing we saw this week, very quietly, that President Biden debuted his a new message of sorts, talking, trying to not say the word Trump, but say, hey, this mega crowd. And he tried to lump abortion rights and, and some of these other things in there. It, it, it tells me they're, the White House is looking for a new message here. What'd you make of it? Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely right. They're seeing these, they we're six months out of the midterms. They're seeing the, how big the consequences are here. And they are trying to edge with this messaging right. a little bit, trying to broaden it out. We'll see how effective it is. But it, the fact that the message is still being developed this late in the of game. Of course they want a, big, a new message. Yeah. Eight and a half percent inflation, yeah. a disastrous withdrawal of Afghanistan. Uh, Allie, is there anything that's going to get passed? In the Senate? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really look very likely. They might be able to do this competition bill that could help with supply chain issues. USICA is what it was called. It's gone through a million namings since then. But at the Both same the time... the Senate have passed a version of the bill. Of exactly. course this bill's going to pass. Of course. That's the only yeah. one that I think has an ultimate path. But in terms of these energizing issues that we're talking about, yeah. specifically on abortion, no, these are going nowhere fast. And I think that's actually why you're making this turn away from Trump to Trumpism and MAGA, yeah. because it's better to do the broad messaging than it is just on him. All right. That's all we have for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you do enjoy your Mother's Day. Don't forget to call her if you haven't yet. And we'll be back next week because if it's Sunday, it's Beat the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts.